So good morning. Uh, welcome to the sixth Jula VRC Vaccine Research Forum this year. So we didn't have it uh, two years ago. Um, so my great honor uh, to join uh, Jurong Khan University Faculty of Medicine, School of Medicine, and Jula Vaccine Research Center uh, to run this program. Before we could start, uh, very interesting uh, programs on mRNA LNP technology, the discovery for uh, the good of uh, global health. I'd like to use these uh, two quotes that uh, most of the medical students, medical uh, doctors, and healthcare workers, and medical scientists in this country has been uh, follow up to this uh, quote. True success is not in the learning, but in the its application to benefit of mankind. Placing self-interest second and the interest of humanity first, good fortune, prosperity, and honor will be fall on you by Prin Mahidon of Songkra, our father of the modern medicines and other father of the King Lama Denai, the past king, our beloved past king. Now, before we go to start the session, I'd like to uh, have all of us to join to congratulate our three honorable speakers uh, who recently received uh, Prince Mahidon Award 2021. And many awards, just only this morning, he got, uh, both three got another award from Vietnam and uh, from Japan and uh, a week ago from Vietnam. So I think many more international prestigious award is uh, coming. And it's proof, the evidence that doing for uh, humanity uh, or mankind as the first priority and the prosperity will be coming before to you. So let me call upon uh, our, our Dean, the Professor Chan Chai, to present a favor appreciation and then congratulation to the First Lady, Kathy. Uh, so Kathy, Professor Kat, Catherine uh, uh, Carico, so please uh, on the stage. All this flower is made from um, mulberry paper, specially designed for three of you, and uh, done by my uh, friend daughter. So she run a company called the Paper Flower uh, by Hands. So I think it's really special. <laughs> and you can keep uh, decorate uh, back home for years. <laughs> and uh, let me call upon uh, our ex-dean and also the chair of the School of Global Health, Professor Suti Pong, to present a follow of congratulation to uh, Drew, uh, Professor Drew Weisman. Please uh, come up to the, on the stage. Next, may I ca call upon uh, Dr. Nakhon. He's uh, the director of the National Vaccine Institute to present again an, another uh, flower of congratulation to, to Peter. So Professor Peter, so Chris, please. I think we need another, uh, at least one group picture. 
uh, photo together before we go to start the session. Please, uh, uh, all the three honorable speakers, and uh, yeah. Let me start the first session. Please. Sadikap. Good morning, um, all the participants of the sixth July VRC Vaccine Research Forum. Um, both on site in this conference room and online via Facebook Live and YouTube Live. This is very timely um, vaccine research forum in the COVID 19 pandemic. Um, so this is Tana Patpalaka from Jula VRC, Jolanta University. Um, it is a great honor to be a moderator for the first session this morning. We have three fantastic talks for this uh, forum. So th the first uh, speaker for this session uh, is Professor Dr. Katalin Kariko. Um, please allow me to briefly introduce Professor Kariko. while we are uh, waiting for the slide. Um, she received her PhD in biochemistry from Joseph Attila University in Hungary. She moved to the US and was trained as postdoctoral fellow at Temple University. Her work has always been centered around mRNA molecule for therapeutics. At University of Pennsylvania, where she took up a position, she collaborated with uh, Professor Drew Weisman, which is also here today with us. Uh, to develop an mRNA technology that is fundamentally reshaping the landscape of vaccine development and the future of gene therapies. As we all know, um, the mRNA technology has enormous impact as vaccine uh, for the COVID-19 pandemic, which saved millions of lives around the world. With her contribution to the development of mRNA technology as vaccine, she was awarded by many pe prestigious awards, including the Lasker, the Buckley Cl Clinical Medical Research Award, the Breakthrough Prize in Life Science Award, and others. And she also was on the Time Magazine Hero of the Year 2021 uh, last year, and also for the Prince Mahidon Award um, this week. So. Um, for the first session, we will hear about the story of how MRI technology was discovered and put into use as vaccines against disease. So please join me and welcome Professor Calico. everybody. Uh, today I will talk about the mRNA development for therapy. As you will hear, it did not happen overnight, it seems for many people, but uh, we worked on decades and not just us, but many, many other scientists from the early 50s actually. And here uh, I show you the timeline 
which is uh, from 1961, the discovery of mRNA when it happened. And, um, and it took, a, oops, that's what happened when uh, somebody who is familiar with Apple started to work with uh, PC. So uh, from 1961, it took 60 years to get the first approved uh, RNA product. For me, these are the main uh, important, uh, 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 important uh, dates when uh, something very important, I think, happened, which advanced our technology. This was uh, 1978, when uh, isolated mRNA was delivered to mammalian cells. In 84, when first time we could make RNA in a test tube. And uh, 1990, when first mRNA was injected to an animal and it translated and was detected. And 2000, when uh, we discovered that uh, this RNA we are making in the tube actually is inflammatory. 2005, we come up with a solution for that. And uh, in 2017, first uh, publication came out when a nucleoside modified RNA was wrapped in a lipid nanoparticle and sh showed that how good vaccine is. So we started uh, to discovery of the mRNA long time ago in the 50s when scientists want to understand that uh, how from the DNA, which is present in the nuclei, the information gets to the cytoplasma where the protein is synthesized. And of course, one obvious thing was, uh, you know, the synthesis was known, protein synthesis is happening in the ribosome. So they look closely where they can find some kind of material which carried the information, the message out of the nucleus. And they first, when they looked at the uh, RNA, in the, from the cell they had to realize that actually that RNA which is in the ribosome is not the well thought uh, messenger RNA, actually it was the ribosomal RNA and how they learned it, that they isolated the uh, DNA from bacteria and the GC content of the DNA was very different, whereas when they isolated the RNA is all of that was the same. As we know, all of the ribosomal RNA in the bacteria is the same length, same composition. So it was not uh, the ribosomal RNA, what they looked for. But one day, you know, in uh, 1961, they identified that molecule, and the, importantly, they both paper, in a consecutive paper in Nature, they mentioned that it is a very unstable intermediate. And even today, you know that how unstable the RNA is, both inside the cells and on the shelf. So now that we know that the information flows from the DNA, Go to, the, uh, go to the mRNA and from, I am not moving. <laughs> I'm not sure. Okay, so from the mRNA and how the protein produce. So this is the information flow in, uh, information flow in, in, in the cell. Yes, okay, that's good. No, it's not working up there. Um, mm -hmm. Some help here. So, that's okay, I can take it. I, but scientists didn't know how to synthesize. So the only thing what they could do is to isolate. And they isolated from murine uh, reticulocyte which is a precursor of red blood cells. And it is very enriched from hemoglobin, uh, 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 globin beta chains. So that was the, in the 69, 70s that they could use this kind of RNA for investigation. They translated in uh, lysate, cell lysate, they injected to oocyte and demonstrated that the mRNA carried the information which would translate it pro properly in this system to uh, globin beta chain. For me, in 1978 was uh, an important uh, uh, milestone here when first time the RNA, which they isolated, like similarly the previous scientists, and they put into the liposome. 
So this liposome protected uh, the RNA from degradation and it had to enter to mammalian cells. Again, two consecutive nature paper published this about delivering uh, uh, the uh, globin RNA inside mammalian cells, primary cells, and demonstrating that the protein was synthesized. So this was the first time when uh, uh, mammalian cells mRNA tra transfected RNA was translated in mammalian cells. We were reading about this paper when I was working in Hungary and uh, in the Biological Research Center, and uh, we tried to uh, use this kind of uh, liposome delivery, but in that case, we did not isolate the RNA, we used plasmid to deliver inside the cell. But I am mentioning this because for me, it was a very important, because this was the first time I encountered that delivering nucleic acid inside the mammalian cells is, uh, can be translated to protein, and that's why I encourage all of the students, you know, start somewhere, and then you don't know where it will leave you. So we did this experiment and uh, encouraged us <coughs> to uh, uh, move further. But I myself, I entered to RNA laboratories. I made small uh, RNA, which was, had antiviral effect. It was 2 prime, 5 prime. My supervisor here on the right is shown is a uh, Yenu Thomas. And when I entered the laboratory, he's an organic chemist, and he synthesized cap analogs for uh, people who were working in all over the world, and here he sent to uh, Aaron Shotkin, for example, in uh, New Jersey, because they needed reference material to identify what is in the five prime end of the RNA. So in 1975 was really the year of the cap, because in end of the year also Bernard Moss and colleague discovered that how naturally the cat gets to the RNA, and this enzyme was uh, discovered. So some scientists try to uh, advance to delivery, some understanding better about the RNA. The ma major milestone was 1984, when first time the RNA could be synthesized in a tube. And these were scientists at uh, Harvard University, Douglas Melton and Paul Krieg. And, uh, Although scientists before them, they try to translate uh, RNA, but uh, they are using bacterial enzyme and other, and the fidelity was not uh, good, and it was uh, too cumbersome to make. And this was very simple. The promoter was very short, and this phage polymerase, RNA polymerase worked very well. And uh, what they did, they did human beta interferon coding uh, uh, RNA from the template, and uh, this RNA had kept 5 prime, 3 prime UTR, the characteristic uh, structure of the RNA. And what they did is uh, they, they injected it to frog oocyte because the cell is big, and this was the delivery of the day in that 1984, injecting directly inside the cell. And when they incubated this frog oocyte, injected with human beta interferon mRNA, what they found is that the supernatan in those uh, uh, oocytes of the 10 hours they collected, it had antiviral effect. So they knew that uh, mRNA, what they uh, created, uh, transcribed, and it translated to a functional protein. Uh, of course, it was very tedious, and you cannot inject cell by cell, so for us, uh, was important uh, when 1987 lipofectin was this, uh, introduced and commercially became available. Because now that the negatively charged RNA just could be mixed with the positively charged lipid and then could put into mammalian cells. This was uh, used for uh, delivering uh, the first time RNA inside the cell. And um, so it, in this, this uh, eight, Late, uh, 90, in late, late 80s, it was also important that uh, when scientists had one protocol, let's say RNA isolation or this lipofectin, they published and then the same year already you could purchase it. So it was uh, that kind of uh, uh, time was in the uh, end of the 80s. So 1990 was the first uh, when uh, uh, John Wolf and colleagues reported that injecting luciferase and coding mRNA to the muscle of a mice, they could measure uh, the enzyme. And uh, so this uh, encouraged many, many people who entered actually early on on the mRNA field that maybe in vivo the mRNA could be useful. And 
we were also, and I was also one of those. In the early 90s, uh, you could see publication came out maybe once in a year, not like in these days that every hour you can read about mRNA, some kind of publication. And the, actually, the first one was interesting. Floyd Bloom uh, team at uh, Scrip uh, published that uh, vasopressin mRNA was therapeutic. Uh, and uh, in 93, 94, those were when uh, uh, mRNA was used for infectious disease vaccine. And um, uh, one was the Martinon and Mayalin colleagues they used uh, for liposome to deliver, while all of the others actually were naked RNA. And the 94 in self-amplifying RNA was used in Karolinska. And later on in the 90s, late 90s, almost all of the paper was about uh, cancer vaccine, not much about uh, infectious disease vaccination. And um, many people in our field who established companies also in, in Germany and, and in the US was inspired by Eli Gilboa, who uh, uh, established also a company in 1997, Merix, and they started to use mRNA for human trial. And uh, that was, uh, they did uh, the human dendritic cells, they uh, isolated cells, they treated ex vivo. But all of this happening, you know, and um, I myself, I uh, went to University of Pennsylvania, and uh, I also were interested to make mRNA. I was not interested in vaccine for cancer vaccine. I want to make mRNA codes for therapeutic protein. First, I worked in cardiology and wa wanted to do mRNA with uh, urokinase receptor coding RNA. That was our interest. Intimal thickening was the major problem. So I am showing here to you that when we did urokinase receptor mRNA, and uh, for me, that was a big uh, surprise that delivering the RNA could make this protein, uh, which was elaborately post-translational modified. It was glycosylated, GPI linked to the membrane, and it cell knew all of these things. You just had to deliver the RNA, and this uh, uh, receptor, which was made, was functional. It needed all of this modification to be functional. At that point, we thought that the mRNA will be good, at least if not else, cell therapy. And uh, when I was doing, uh, moving to neurosurgery, doing more experiment, injecting mRNA to the brain, I never noticed any kind of immune problem. But when I met my colleague and fellow awardees, uh, Drew Weissman, and uh, he was interested to make vaccine, and he will talk more about that, um, uh, I made the mRNA for his, uh, uh, his, uh, his design, and uh, this was a GAG, HIV-specific uh, uh, coding uh, RNA. And uh, he was very happy, as he, we reported here in 2000, that uh, the RNA was translated highly. It was, was a very optimal, very good uh, vaccine candidate because it also activated all of these important uh, factors. And we also measured inflammatory molecules. And as I was working in neurosurgery, and uh, planning to make different kind of mRNA for uh, therapy for the patient, I was not happy at all that uh, the RNA was inflammatory. So we tried to figure out why it is inflammatory, because we are in 2000, there was nothing known that uh, single-stranded RNA can activate anything. And uh, what we did eventually is um, that uh, we were thinking that maybe the RNA is uh, inflammatory and immunogenic because we are adding to the immune cells from outside. And of course, in our cells, the RNA is always inside the cell unless there is some injury. So we isolated uh, from mammalian cells different types of RNA and added to the dendritic cells delivered with lipofactin. And we measured the TNF alpha. And in the purple, you can see that when the RNA was made conventionally from the four basic nucleotides, it induced a lot of TNF alpha, a lot of inflammation. And when we isolated the different RNA, which was isolated from mammalian cells, was less immunogenic. You can see that the tRNA was not uh, immunogenic at all. And uh, so knowing that the tRNA has a lot of uh, nucleoside modification, we were wondering that could it be that uh, maybe those modification is uh, responsible for why the immune cells do not recognizing. 
uh, that type of RNA. Of course, we thought also because it is shorter and many other things, but to try out, you know, we thought that maybe we have to make an mRNA which has this kind of modification. So how we could do that, you know, we have no way uh, knowing it because nobody tried to do nucleoside modified mRNA before. And um, in nature, all of your RNA is made from the four basic nucleotides and post-transcriptionally modification introduced by enzymes. But what are those enzymes? Not only that you cannot order, you couldn't order that time, but you, this was not even known. So it was known that all of these modifications there, and I'm showing you just to scare you a little bit that how many things are there in our RNA naturally, how many different modifications, but uh, with enzyme we couldn't introduce. So we had to order it. And we selected with Drew to order only uh, nucleotide triphosphate, which are already modified that, uh, to make the RNA, because uh, we want to make sure that we are not uh, creating some kind of toxic material. So we insisted that all of the modified nucleotides we are using has to be something that in our body is already uh, present inside the RNA because knowing that some uh, uh, nucleoside can be very, very toxic. So we made the, uh, purchase these uh, nucleotides, and um, we purchased 10 different ones, hoping that from the out of 100, those will be inclu included here, which makes the RNA non-immunogenic, non-inflammatory. And from the 10, five we successfully incorporated and made uh, the RNA. And, um, when we look closer to see that uh, is, uh, whether they have uh, different immunogenicity, we found that uh, some were still immunogenic, but some RNA was not. And closer look showed that when the uridine was changed to anything, pseudouridine, 5-methyluridine, 2 thiouridine that those RNA were not inflammatory. We didn't know that nature selected uridine to be the molecule recognized by uh, the immune system. Of course, uh, we uh, wanted to make RNA, which codes for a protein. So the next thing was that we had to see that whether any of this uh, RNA would be, which is non-immunogenic, whether it is translatable. And although the 2 thiouridine was not translated, but happily we could see that pseudouridine containing RNA not only translated as well the uh, conventional RNA, but it was 10 times uh, more efficient. And uh, we spent two years, three years, trying to figure out why the pseudouridine containing RNA translates better and gets so much more protein, the stability and other what we discovered. Of course, it was interesting to find out that whether in vivo this uh, RNA is also non-immunogenic, it translates very well. So at that point, we did erythropoietin coding RNA, and which is uh, responsible for stimulating uh, uh, red blood cell uh, differentiation. And in red, you can see that when we in injected very small, who work with nucleic acid RNA, 0.1 microgram to mice was sufficient to uh, in increase and uh, uh, detect this uh, uh, erythropoietin protein in the blood for four days. And uh, the conventional RNA, we just uh, degraded much faster and a shorter period of time was detectable. Because the uh, uh, erythropoietin coding uh, RNA from pseudouridine was present for four days, we could see uh, on the right panel that the hematocrit increased because in four days, continuous erythropoietin presence increased the uh, red blood cell uh, differentiation. And uh, when we injected once, we could see high level. When we weekly injected on the very right panel, that we could maintain the high hematocrit value. So the RNA was functional translated to a functional protein, and also it was important that uh, it was not in the central panel shows that uh, the nucleoside modified RNA was not uh, uh, immunogenic, did not induce any interferon. So uh, here we used uh, a different, uh, not uh, lipofectin because it was very toxic, we used uh, 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 transit, but uh, you will hear from Peter that uh, there are other uh, formulations are much more potent, even for this kind of experiment. So it was 2012, and scientists later, when we 
also, you know, we discovered that uh, the TOS like receptors 7 and 8 was activated by uridine. They uh, discovered in, uh, in 2014, uh, 16, uh, that uh, actually the TOR like receptor 8 can be activated by uridine, just the nucleoside in itself. It can have dimerization. So we found uh, uh, support for our discovery. In 2013, I left the University of Pennsylvania. Ugo Zahin, the CEO of BioNTech, uh, hired me. BioNTech was at that time, was a very small company. We were on the uh, university campus and uh, working in different labs. And um, my role was at uh, BioNTech also to uh, develop uh, nucleoside modified mRNA that codes for therapeutic protein. And here is one what we uh, published where we, uh, mRNA, we generated mRNA coding for bispecific antibody. That uh, kind of antibody can bring close to the T cells, to the tumor cells, and eliminate. Why it is important uh, using mRNA? Because uh, bispecific uh, antibody, the protein itself has two hours half-life, so the patient had to carry a pump, per, which had to be filled up every day, with uh, this protein. So the mRNA can be beneficial when the protein half-life is very short, when um, uh, injecting the protein could uh, wash, the blood stream can wash away, whereas when you d inject somewhere the RNA, it can be translated to the protein and you can have a gradient, continuous uh, protein production. So we did a lot of uh, study uh, from 2013 at uh, our main thing was that we try to optimize the uh, RNA to make improvements to the structural element on the RNA. We introduced new purification, which was scalable, so it could be used for production, for GMP production. And uh, all of them is improve the, the translation and get more and more protein. And you can see on the right panel, when we did all of the optimization, and we did the purification, the nucleoside modification, we could get high level of protein production from that RNA for quite a long time. And um, I just mentioned one uh, codon optimization which uh, other people were doing. So the uridine, which we had, of course, we eliminated and put pseudouridine so that our RNA was not immunogenic. Other scientists tried to eliminate immunogenicity of the RNA by making GC rich codon. So this is the lower uh, stripes shows that. But of course, you cannot eliminate all of the uridine from the mRNA because there are amino acids that you cannot code without uridine. And actually, half of the amino acid, half of the amino acid you cannot code without uridine. So it, every time how immunogenic your RNA will be depends on the composition of your antigen if you want to use for vaccination. And, uh, of course, codon optimization is also can be dangerous because or you can have out-of-frame translation products which might be uh, causing unwanted effect, or you are losing some kind of favorable out-of-frame product, which uh, it, in case, for example, the SARS-CoV-2 case also was reported. So uh, replacing the uridine with pseudouridine is still more favorable, and you don't have to do extra coding and uh, uh, afraid of uh, other effects. I don't talk about too much how our uh, um, uh, development of the vaccine happened at BioNTech and Pfizer. We already, with Pfizer, were already working on, from 2018, to develop uh, influenza vaccine that was, you know, in public domain. And uh, we advanced the studies. We were ready when, uh, you know, the uh, pandemic happened. And switching over to another uh, virus coding sequence was, uh, didn't take that much of a time. And uh, this is how we ended up in uh, 2000, uh, last year, August, when uh, actually 60 years after discovery of RNA, we had a approved product. So where we are now today, um, or you can hear from my colleagues also talk about many of the clinical trial ongoing with uh, using uh, messenger RNA, here nucleoside modified RNA. Uh, most advanced was for 
VGFA mRNA used for uh, wound healing for the necrotic uh, diabetic wound. That was a clinical trial treating uh, those kind of uh, wounds. There were also VGFA mRNA was injected to the heart during bypass surgery. This clinical trial, phase two, just ended uh, uh, recently and moved further to phase three because the uh, heart for the uh, heart uh, performance increased uh, significantly for the patient who uh, underwent treatment. Um, mRNA was used uh, not just as a vaccine, but also uh, I participated together with Sanofi and BioNTech to develop mRNA coding for cytokines, which will uh, help to uh, turn the cold tumor to hot tumor and help uh, to re uh, remove uh, remotely located uh, uh, metastatic uh, cancer cells uh, from the patient. We showed this in uh, animal studies and now that is ongoing in a human trial with Sanofi. And of course, uh, passive immunization, mRNA coding for antibodies that uh, were also developed by other companies, and uh, genetic disease treatment, which is also by Intelia, was presented recently that um, it was very successful. Those, these are the ongoing clinical trials, and many more is going on, but uh, also many, many clinical, preclinical studies that uh, I try to list here some, but uh, even more is uh, present. So um, the future is great to use the mRNA as a platform for three different diseases. And uh, with that, I will thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for, for that wonderful talk. So we hear the story from the discovery of mRNA into uh, clinical application. So for those of you who um, listen to this talk online, you can type in your question in, in the comment, and then we will relay that question to, to the speaker. Okay, so um, let, let me start with the first question. So for the mRNA to be used as a vaccine and therapeutic molecules, I think it, um, the, the immune um, recognition is a problem for therapeutic um, use because it will trigger immune um, 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 response to that molecule. So what's the, the balance between the use as an, a vaccine to trigger strong immune response and the use as a therapeutic molecules to, to, um, to express the protein for, for the purpose of, of application. Yes, so uh, one of the important things uh, I would say, the formulation. So as um, I uh, did not mention, but should have mentioned that, uh, messenger RNA is also used for uh, treat uh, autoimmune diseases where you want the immune system to tolerate the encoded protein. And so for this one, for example, the uh, lipid nanoparticle would not contain one element, which is the ionizable lipid, which actually the adjuvant in the present vaccine. Because now you don't want to activate, you want this uh, immune system to tolerate. And this is the same when for genetic diseases, you try to replace some protein which is missing, you should not uh, put uh, uh, and should not activate uh, the immune system. So the formulation had to be uh, different. And of course, you know, the formulation also, what is, uh, we will hear about, you know, that decorating on the surface to when it is delivered systemically, it will find the right uh, tissue, right organ, and then locally will be translated the protein, so less side effect. So the form formulation of the RNP is very important. Um, any question from the floor? Yes, please, please go to the microphone and ask your question.
just wondering because like a lot of the RNA vaccines that are being used, they're mostly the messenger RNA format. So um, I saw that there were publications about self-amplifying RNAs, but I don't see a lot of them being used in the clinical or the therapeutic setting. Um, I was wondering like what challenges are needed to be overcome uh, before we can move into that field. So, so I think let me yes. repeat the question because yes. so you may not. So the question was about that um, uh, you have seen publication about self amplifying RNA and you haven't seen in vaccine human data related to that. It is not because you uh, kind of uh, missed it. I, I didn't see either. And uh, we know that the clinical trial was running, but um, it seems like uh, the, even the last week publication came out from JSK was still showing animal studies with it. Uh, it seems that um, it works better in animals, uh, the self-amplifying RNA. And you might be aware of that uh, BioNTech phase one trial, we did uh, include the uh, U-containing RNA, pseudo uridin containing RNA, self-amplifying RNA, and the selection was for the nucleoside-modified RNA coding for the full uh, spike protein. That was we selected based on the data. So um, we, we might see the data will come out what, uh, you know, happened in, in uh, one was the Imperial College, I think they did one in, in uh, London, and then other was in, uh, uh, by Arcturus, did clinical trial, and the and, uh, JSK with the human trial, so we will see. But uh, I, I don't know that why we didn't see the data yet. Any question? Yeah. Uh, thank you. First, and then we go to... Kathy, no. thank you very much for your a very nice talk. So the question uh, to follow up on the cell amplifying the mRNA, could, could you uh, try to, uh, so what the pro and con? Because uh, cell amplifying mRNA, what I'm understanding is not, is not the nucleoside modified at mRNA. Uh, so, so the pro and con between the uh, nucleoside modified at mRNA and cell amplifying mRNA. I didn't think so. So, so if you uh, if you modify the if you modify the self amplifying RNA, you don't get any product because what is recognized is a structural element, and then it is different because uh, the pseudo uridine actually, if it's in a stem loop structure uh, the, in the tRNA, for example, in present uh, in the loop a pseudo uridine, that the s uh, stem is is much stronger, so that the structural uh, differences is the reason, and, and uh, of course, when the self-amplifying RNA is amplifying, that you generate a double-stranded RNA. Although you know we know that it is in the spherules, which would be a little bit uh, separated from the rest of the cytoplasm. But but it is when I was working in the, in the early 90s with self-amplifying RNA, what I found is that it uh, when I used tissue culture, that I had to always had uh, subconfluent because the cell had to be divided. Although we know that it is uh, amplifying, everything happened in the cytoplasm, but somehow required the cell to divide. And this was not true for the conventional RNA. Confluent uh, monolayer, I put mRNA and all of the cells evenly, but it was light blue, let's say, if it is uh, beta galactosidase. And this was self-amplifying. I get few cells, but they were super, super producer. Yeah. So, so how can you, can you hear me? Yeah. So in terms of uh, delivery of the mRNA for the you know, protein production, how can you control the target cell and the dosage of the production? You know, can you tweak that? What is the strategy for that? Yes. So of course, you know, those who are working with plasmids, you know, they can select promoters and other things. Of course, with RNA, you are delivering and whatever uh, cell they are entering, they will translate. 
So what we have done when we try to avoid certain cells, we didn't want them to translate, like um, let's say hepatocytes, which has uh, known to have a microRNA uh, 122. What we did, we incorporated to the three prime untranslated region target site for this uh, uh, microRNA. So when we delivered, when we could see that uh, uh, hepatocytes are not translating. So if uh, the same way you can have, you can avoid uh, hematopoietic cells because also they have uh, enriched for certain uh, microRNA. And so you can select where not to translate. And of course, uh, you know, Drew might talk about uh, uh, that how you can specifically target uh, either by um, putting, uh, targeting molecule on the surface of the lipid nanoparticle that will ended up in the right uh, compartment or right uh, cell or tissue, and, uh, and then you can selectively uh, deliver those. Uh, the other is, uh, you know, location. So, you know, if it is in the skin, you can apply uh, for the wound, or, uh, you know, in the intramuscularly injected, it won't go systemic, it will work locally. Second question is the, the translation, you know, Label, okay. if you if you want to control that, I mean, how can you <clears throat> control the right, expression of those protein, the amount of the, of the protein? Mm -hmm. So it is quite linear. For a certain, you add more RNA, you get more protein, and and it is uh, just like a conventional medicine. You know, if you get, find a good effect, you reapply. And uh, so that's what we have done, for example, which I showed in the NMR for uh, erythropoietin RNA weekly. We injected and we could maintain high level of uh, uh, hematocrit because protein is produced and uh, because it's naturally present in the animal body, so you don't generate antibody against it. I mean, I think my question is more like, in, if we think that, that as the medicine, right, we want it to be in the certain, right, therapeutic window for, you know, for the patient? How mm -hmm. can we control, you know, those heterogeneity of that translation? Or do you think it's not that it, vary a lot? Yes, so, you know, um, we, we established with a company with uh, Drew and, you know, we tried to explain and that's what the scientist is doing, saying that, okay, uh, mRNA is not good for everything. Instead of saying, oh, it is good for everything, you are right. When the therapeutic window is very narrow, you cannot control. So for me, I don't think that insulin will be such a thing that we can deliver with RNA. But, you know, you are young scientists and you don't know about and you will do it and maybe it's doable. So sometimes it's good not to, to know too, too many things. But uh, definitely, true. good question. That's very true. So, so um, follow up on this question. Is uh, cell type specific targeting of mRNA is the future? or it doesn't matter whether you put it? Uh, Drew will present if it's present already. Not okay, the, not the <laughs> great. Not the future, it is already here. All right, um, any other questions? Okay. Ajahn Warasak, please. Hello, hello. Uh, well, Dr. Karigo, thank you so much. Uh, I'm Warasak, a pediatric geneticist. Uh, your presentation is very informative. You brief more than 60 years of mRNA science from 1961 up to now in 30 minutes. That's amazing. And it's very inspiring. You observe nature and uh, find that different RNA have different immunogenicity mm -hmm. and exploit it to benefit mankind. That, that's uh, also very amazing. So my, I have an, a theoretical question. So pseudouridine RNA is not inflammatory or, or very low immunogenic. Mm -hmm. So is it possible that uh, there would be a class of virus that evolved to be a pseudouridine RNA virus? And, and what would happen to, to humans? Uh, are we going to extinct because we cannot uh, have immune to, to this class of RNA virus? Yeah, so you are not developing uh, immune response against the RNA, you are immune response against the viral protein. 
and that was the advantage for the vaccine. So you Im repeatedly you can deliver the RNA because the immune system is not seeing, you know. So that uh, I am not worrying, but I have to tell you naturally how we are actually our mRNA also has pseudouridine. I didn't mention to you it was discovered 10 years after we discovered and we put into the RNA. Is uh, there are uh, specific uh, uh, pseudouridine synthase and. Uh, in our ribosomal RNA, we have a guide RNA. And so it is sequenced specifically, can uh, guide it, and this, uh, 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 this carry can, the enzyme is working and, and can change. And actually, the changes just flip over. So it is a, a pseudouridine synthase, no ATP is needed. And that's how it, so it will be six point specific and, uh, and the pseudouridine synthase, which is very specifically can some tRNA and other small RNA is changing. Those are, uh, those are enzyme again, recognizing the whole sequence. So, you know, that uh, the virus had to carry itself with those kind of uh, specific enzyme or guide. But even if they would do, what happened is that you de develop immune response against the coded protein, which is on the surface. And so it yeah. wouldn't be uh, too much problem. I have to tell you that uh, they identified the coronaviral RNA also has nucleoside modification. Yeah, thank you. And, and is it possible that this virus doesn't uh, translate into protein? It, it acts it's harmful to us at the RNA level. It replicates itself at the RNA and, and harm us at the RNA level. For example, it's RNA toxicity. It binds to, uh, let's say, DNA binding protein mm -hmm. uh, to this RNA. Yeah. So, you, so mm -hmm. it's harmful. You don't have to, you don't have to imagine that <laughs> because there are a viroids and virusoids. It is uh, present in plants. And, uh, you know, when you have this viru viroids, Actually, they don't code for anything. Some of them is like 200 nucleotide long, usually circular RNA. And in two years, the whole uh, palm tree uh, forest can be destroyed by the source. They didn't know how they act. What happened is actually they bind to the ribosomal RNA and stop protein synthesis. They don't code for anything. They just can replicate using the cell machinery, no protein, but they put a, a you know, the monkey wrench to the system. So it is already invented by nature. Yeah, thank you but so not much. in human, actually, it plants. Yeah, nature and you are amazing. Thank you. Any other question from the floor or from the Facebook Live? You can type in your comments. So, so I, I'll ask you a very basic biology question. Why do we make all these modifications to the RNA in our cells? What, what's the purpose besides, you know, being avoiding the immune recognition. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, structurally, some of them was uh, uh, recognized. As I mentioned, you know, when there is a stem loop and you have in the uh, modified pseudouridine, let's say the pseudouridine in the loop, the stem already structurally is uh, much more stable. So why is this good at? They demonstrated that the tRNA in a, present in a boiling uh, bacteria, which is in the boiling water, if all of the tRNA would be G and C, even which has three hydrogen binding, they couldn't, couldn't keep that structure. So the modification helps, you know, structural element. Of course, for the next generation of scientists is waiting to understand more about uh, these uh, modifications, the importance, uh, what they are doing. All right. Um, any other question from? Okay, Dr. Natia, please. Well, hi, Katrina. Um, thank you so much for such an impressive um, talk. And I'm an immunologist, and actually I asked my medical student to listen to this online. So hopefully they get inspired by, by your work. Um, uh, I wanted to ask about, because we teach the student about basic RNA and, and DNA, right? And now the field of non-coding RNA has been arising a lot, right? You mentioned mm -hmm. microRNA and things like that. So I wanted to um, ask about your input about, you know, how basic science, the study more of this non-coding RNA can translate it 
into things that, the similar things that you have done. So your students will do that <laughs> because... <laughs> Yeah, can you please inspire them <laughs> a little bit here? <laughs> yes, so you know, you just have to keep uh, doing and be passionate. I, I work with RNA, you know, in Hungary, I already, when I was a gro graduate student, you know, I learned how to modify, how to label, degrade, many times it happened. Okay, so I learned and, and it was, you have a feeling for that molecule, like uh, your student will have and then they will, uh, understand better. I'm in a big uh, research on known coding RNA and others, the micro RNA, and I am not an expert on it, not even on mRNA, you know, <laughs> I know certain things, and, um, and that's what uh, I try to make it useful. Yeah, just stick with something that you believe in and keep working on that, right? <laughs> yeah, using you as an uh, inspiration. Well, thank you so much. <laughs> yeah, I am sure your student had a closer a uh, person who inspire them as you. Okay. Uh, one question from the um, um, YouTube, YouTube um, channel. How does mRNA vaccine cause severe side effects like myocarditis? How does mRNA vaccine cause severe side effects such as myocarditis? Uh, I am a biochemist and really not a, a physician, but um, I don't know. Drew is a physician, and maybe he will answer that okay. question. We, we have two questions for Drew already, so we keep that. Yeah. Yes, so it seems that uh, All right. yeah, there, Professor Kulitz will answer that. Great. <laughs> Any other question? Okay, Dr. Ganita, please. Hi, uh, I'm Ganita. Uh, I'm, I'm a bacteriologist. So I'm uh, really are interested in uh, making vaccines for bacteria. So do you think mRNA vaccine will work for bacteria, uh, in, uh, vaccine for bacterial infection or parasitic infection? And what we need to modify that's different from uh, viral or cancer? So as I said, I never wanted to make vaccines. It was Drew wanted to make the vaccine. <laughs> I want to therapeutic, but um, you know, because uh, some bacteria is recognized by, uh, you know, on the surface there are not protein, the RNA codes for protein, but there are also a vaccine, especially uh, in development for TB, which is intracellular bacteria, and then certain uh, product is presented on the infected cell surface, but uh, Drew will say uh, about that, uh, you know, other, other uh, kind of uh, like parasites like uh, malaria already, you know, identifying, but it, you know, it is much uh, more challenge because you have so many proteins there to uh, select from, but already knowledge is accumulating to identify which are the critical protein that uh, you have to generate immune response against, which will protect the patient. But he will talk about the vaccine, and so leave the vaccine question for Drew, <laughs> and toxic question for <laughs> Professor Kulis. Okay. Um, okay. Okay, Dr. Directly, please. Hi, uh, I'm Dr. Directly. I'm immunologist as well. So I have a question. If we, um, so let's say if we modify other nucleoside instead of uridine to pseudo-uridine that, like you did. So do you think it's worth trying to do that in terms of treatment of other diseases? What was the do you think it's worth trying to modify other nucleoside instead of uridine? To other um, type of modification besides the pseudo-uridine? Is it uh, yes, possible? I, I mentioned that uh, you know, one of them, the 2 uridine, which is naturally present in tRNA, were not translated. But when, when we ch changed the ratio, we could see translation. So what happened is that certain modification, such as like um, uh, M6A in the A, or, um, or the tio, 2 tio in the U, it somehow the start codon AUG cannot tolerate. And um, uh, it seems that the a AUG, the U, can be pseudouridine. So when, uh, uh, when you change and try to other modification, we didn't have that like a, a small, shorter product is produced, no product is produced with 2 uridine M6A, 
We were surprised because M6A modification is present in mRNA, but of course not 100%. And in, of course, in all of this vaccine and all of the mRNA we analyzed, we changed all of them. We just changed one uh, nucleotide triphosphate in the transcription reaction with the modified version of it. So, um, and we didn't want to uh, experiencing, uh, experimenting with, with uh, those kind of nucleotide triphosphates which are naturally not in our body because they can be very toxic. And I can tell you why. Animal, so in uh, 1993, uh, uh, fialuridine was tested. It is a fluorinated uridine, and it was uh, not toxic in animals, not even in monkeys. But in the human trial, five people died out of 15 volunteers, and it turned out that all t 10 years it took. They identified that only human has a nucleoside transporter, which is has uh, in the middle of it has a, a mitochondrial localization signal, and it pumped everything the modified nucleotides into, into, or nucleoside into the mitochondria. And all of those people died from acidosis. Their kidney, their liver had no mitochondria. So we are very aware of all of these side effects. So insisted, just a natural one. Okay. Um, that's all we have. Okay. No more? Maybe time is up. I think it's time is up. So that's an inspiring talk, and I think it will give um, young scientists of the idea how to go forward. A very, very strong message that you need to be perseverant, strong belief in what you do, and you will prevail somehow, someday. So I would like to close this session by asking Professor Kiet Rakrung Tam to present a token of appreciation to Professor Kariko. Please. Hi. Thank you very much. And then we move on to the second session of the day. Drew Weisman, so he has been the, at our forums a uh, couple of times ago in the past few years. So I actually no need further introduction. Uh, Drew is a professor of uh, medicine and he's expert in the, on the uh, uh, vaccine immunology. And uh, he also the director of the uh, vaccine research uh, uh, center at the UPenn. Uh, we have been uh, collaborating uh, for quite several years and uh, also working on the Jula COP19 mRNA vaccine projects. Uh, what uh, Drew is going to present to us is what we uh, are going on in developing of uh, non or other vaccine uh, beyond uh, COVID-19. 
vaccine and also other future therapeutics uh, approach uh, using mRNA RNP technology. So, uh, so we keep coming up. Yeah, please. Thank you. So the, the, the great part about following Katie is I don't have to give any background. Uh, so I'm going to probably gonna jump through a few of the slides in the beginning um, to make it a little easier. So my, my conflicts of interest, a bunch of patents, uh, companies, stuff like that. So I'll just remind you of the background of RNA. And, and this is mostly to understand that RNA wasn't invented in 10 months and vaccines didn't suddenly appear out of nowhere. Um, the first time RNA was injected into an animal was in 1990. After that, there was a single follow-up that looked at RNA therapeutics in 92 and then all of the studies looked at vaccines. And the, the way they did this was they took dendritic cells out of an animal and then later out of a human, pulsed them with mRNA, um, and then after pulsing them with RNA, injected them back into the human or animal. And the reason for this is that there are 17 different innate immune sensors. So these are germline encoded proteins. They're present in extracellular fluids, on the cell surface, in endosomes, in the cytoplasm, on mitochondria, that bind to and recognize RNA as foreign, as pathogen. They produce a variety of mediators. They make pro-inflammatory cytokines. They make type 1 interferons. They directly inhibit translation, and they induce apoptosis and cell death. So all of those things are bad when you're trying to make an RNA therapeutic, as Katie just explained. So th this is the data that Katie and I generated that led us to figure out modification got rid of recognition of RNA as foreign. And this is just a review. We don't need to go through these. Um, so what Katie didn't mention is that after we made nucleoside-modified mRNA, we didn't get rid of all of the inflammation. And we weren't sure, was, did that simply mean we needed more modifications? Maybe pseudouridine uh, wasn't enough. We added M5C. That didn't help. Uh, and what we figured out is that phage RNA polymerases, so that's the enzyme that copies the DNA and makes mRNA, makes errors. And those errors produce double-stranded RNA contaminants. So we developed a way to get rid of those contaminants. And when we did that, that got rid of any remaining contamination uh, in the RNA that produced inflammatory cytokines. So we were able to make an RNA that didn't activate any inflammation in the cell. And that's what we move forward with. What was striking is that when you combine nucleoside modification with purification, you could increase the amount of protein made by upwards of four logs. So huge increase in the amount of protein produced. So this is, you know, we're, we're talking 2004, 2005, and people would ask us, well, you know, who cares? RNA therapy doesn't work. All of the prior, the prior clinical trials failed. The companies folded. There were a few people left doing RNA, but people really weren't interested in RNA. So they asked us, well, why do you care? And I, I would point out, Protein therapeutics are one of the fastest growing elements in pharmaceutical sciences. They make new monoclonal antibodies every day for new diseases. 
They use them for cancer, for autoimmunity, for hypercholesterolemia, for osteoporosis, for migraines, and they keep adding more. But to make a therapeutic protein, this is a GMP site making therapeutic proteins. You start with a 50,000 liter drum of CHO cells or another cell that makes your protein of interest. You have to make that cell line and optimize it every time you want to make a new protein. You then have to figure out how to purify that protein out of the cell culture contaminants. And it's different for every single protein. So when you want to make a new protein, you start over. With mRNA, you make an RNA sequence. That sequence is used in a single reaction vessel. Uh, Moderna uh, and Pfizer use 100 liter bioreactors to make your RNA. The reaction is identical no matter what the coding sequence is. They then have a single reaction purification. You change the sequence, you don't change anything else. You just plug those into the exact same reactions. So huge flexibility, likely will cost much less to produce RNA, much easier to make, much easier to mass produce, to scale up. But the problem then came, well, how do you deliver mRNA as a therapeutic? We're a bag of RNases. What that means is that every fluid in our body, every cell in our body has RNase in it, which rapidly cleaves and destroys mRNA. So Peter will tell you about this, and this comes from a company that he developed, but producing lipid nanoparticles, which are four lipids that are combined with mRNA, we found was the best way to deliver RNA. And these were some of the early studies. And what we did here is we took luciferase, firefly luciferase, encoding mRNA, and put them into lipid nanoparticles, and then injected them to mice by a variety of routes. And what we found is anything with systemic circulations, IV, IP, went to the liver. That's because lipid nanoparticles bind APOE, which targets them to hepatocytes. But when we injected peripherally, ID, IM, sub Q, we got expression at the site of injection, and that expression continued for many days. You'd see up to 14 days of protein production at the site of injection and in draining lymph nodes. When you think about that from a vaccine, that seemed optimal. So when you make a vaccine, People like live viral vaccines. The reason is that they produce protein for a long time. The immune system needs that to make a good immune response. When you give a protein that's gone in a few hours, you don't make a great immune response. When you give a live virus that sticks around for a few days and makes the antigen for a few days, you get much better immune responses. So with mRNA, we've got both. We have long-term production of protein without having to have a live virus. So we, we put that into a vaccine platform, and we started to make a variety of different vaccines. One of the first we started with was for influenza. So influenza in the United States, you have about 30 to 60,000 deaths per year. It's primarily in the cold winter months. Uh, it's primarily bad in elderly individuals. So th this is a recap of different influenza vaccines in mice using an H1 subtype influenza. And we can see that with all of them, with two immunizations, we typically get HAI titers in the one to 100 or so range. HAI is a pseudo-neutralization titer. A titer of one to 40 is protective in human beings. So we made an mRNA vaccine where we coded for an H1 hemagglutinin in the mRNA. 
And when we immunized animals, uh, inactivated viruses, which is what us old folks get, gave us a, a low titer. Live viruses, which usually our kids will get, had better titers. But the mRNA blew them all away. The mRNA gave a titer of 1 to 2,500. Now, I, I laugh about this now, but I had a collaborator that I worked with who did these titers. It took him a month to get these results because he kept having to repeat the assay over and over and over and diluting the serum more and more, and he didn't believe it. He, he thought I put monoclonal antibodies in the serum, and I was having fun with him. Uh, but, you know, because he had never seen a titer this high for any vaccine. But the mRNA gave enormous titers, and that, that interested everybody. We wanted to understand how this works, how the mRNA works. So this is a cartoon of how B cells recognize antigen. You start with a follicular B cell that binds viruses or viral-like particles. Uh, it binds adjuvants for toll receptors and others. It, that B cell gets help from a CD4 helper cell where it migrates into a germinal center. In the germinal center, the germinal center B cells rapidly proliferate, affinity mature, class switch, turn into long-term memory cells, and long-lived plasma B cells. So we analyzed all of these populations. This is an antigen-specific assay. What that means is that we add hemagglutinin with a fluorescent tag on it. So we're only measuring B cells of these subtypes that bind hemagglutinin. And these are the total numbers in a spleen, similar numbers we're seeing in lymph nodes. Compared to an inactivated virus, mRNA produced about 50 times more antigen-specific B cells of each subtype, germinal center B cells and memory and long-lived plasma cells. So that, that explains our 25-fold increase in antibody titers. What was interesting is we forgot about some mice and we left them for over a year. And we went back to these mice and we looked at the plasma cells in their bone marrows. That's where plasma cells live we saw an enormous number of HA-specific plasma cells in their bone marrows. This is higher than any other progenitor cell in the bone marrow. So it's, it's a huge number of long-lived plasma cells. Now the problem was, and people would ask us this, how is this vaccine working? The mRNA, as we, we, uh, Katie and I both showed you, has no adjuvant activity. It doesn't make any pro-inflammatory cytokines. It doesn't make any in, uh, type uh, 1 interferons. It has no inflammatory activity, which means it has no adjuvant activity. And at the time, lipid nanoparticles weren't believed to have adjuvant activity either. They didn't produce Th1 or Th2 responses. So how was the vaccine working? Vaccines require adjuvant activity. You have to have it in order to stimulate the immune response against whatever antigen you're producing. And typically, adjuvants are Th1 or Th2 inducing. But there are other types of T helper cells, and we were particularly interested in these, which are called T follicular helper cells. TFHs form germinal centers. Without them, you don't get any germinal centers, and you get lousy antibody responses. TFHs in the germinal center drive germinal center B cell proliferation affinity maturation, class switch, formation of memory, and long-lived plasma cells. 
So for any vaccine that makes antibodies, the TFH cell response is critical. So we measured TFH cells in the immunized animals, and, and the results were striking. With the mRNA LNP vaccine, we had about a tenfold increase in the number of T follicular helper cells. We switched to macaques because, number one, macaques are the critical bridge animal to humans. Everything works in mice. Very few things work in macaque or in humans. So we immunized macaques with mRNA LNPs, in this case encoding an HIV envelope immunogen. As a comparison, we gave them the identical envelope protein, but with a double-stranded RNA adjuvant. That's double-stranded RNA is the most potent for inducing T follicular helper cell responses. And then we measured TFHs. For the RNA, both total and uh, antigen-specific, we had huge numbers of TFHs induced. The antigen and double-stranded RNA induced almost nothing. So in both mice and macaques, we found that the LNP adjuvant induced huge levels of T follicular helper cells, and they were responsible for inducing the potent antibody responses that we see. Now, we also found another interesting thing. The type of antibody response differs for different kinds of vaccines and for different kinds of adjuvants. And for most vaccines for influenza, the antibodies recognize the head. The head is the part of the hemagglutinin that binds the sialic acid and allows infection of respiratory epithelial cells. The stock domain is what's responsible for allowing the influenza to get from the inside of the endosome into the cytoplasm, and it allows the virus to infect the cells. The stock responses are subdominant. You don't see them with typical vaccines, and you rarely see them with live virus infection. So we made an assay that could measure either head responses. So here the head is from H1. The response saw the uh, head very clearly. We then exchanged for a different head and we picked a head from a group two distant HA, and we linked that to an H1 stock. H1 responses don't recognize H6 heads. So what we're measuring here are responses to the stock. After a prime or after a boost, we had enormous levels of stock-specific responses. So that's an, a subdominant response. We wanted to know, were those responses useful? Did they do anything in the way of protection? So first, we immunized with an ACAL, which is an H1 virus from 2009. And we challenged the, vi the, the animals with a 1936 virus called PR8. There was no cross-reactivity between the heads, so the, there was no recognition of the 34HA. But when we challenged the animals, they were completely protected from infection with the mRNA, which told us that the stock responses were protective. We wanted to make it a little tougher. So we challenged the animals with an H5 avian influenza viruses. These occasionally appear in humans and cause local epidemics. There's no cross-reactivity at all between the heads of these two viruses, of the H1 and the H5. But again, the animals were completely protected. 
They lost no weight. They survived challenge. So what that told us is that mRNA made a fantastic influenza vaccine. It gave titers of antibodies that were 25 times higher than inactivated viruses. A single immunization could protect animals. The, mecha the mechanism for how they worked were really twofold. One is that the RNA produced protein for upwards of 14 days. In addition, the lipid nanoparticles were an adjuvant that specifically induced T follicular helper cells, which gives you very potent antibody responses. So we wanted to look at now a difficult vaccine. So we looked at HSV2 that primarily causes genital herpes. The reason why we're interested in this is that there's about a half a billion people infected with HSV2. That's 11% of the world's population. It's concerning because some people get very sick. More worrying are infecting partners, both sexual partners and infants that are born from infected mothers. In addition, the risk of getting HIV if you have genital herpes is increased about three to four fold. So HSV2 is a critical worry worldwide. There have been three vaccines that have been tried for HSV2. All of them failed in phase three clinical trials. They didn't protect and they didn't go on any further. So we worked with uh, Harvey Friedman at Penn who had a different idea. And he made an HSV2 vaccine that had uh, the G GV2 immunogen, but it also had GC and GE. GC blocks complement activation. By doing so, it blocks the ability of complement to recognize HSV2 infected cells and stimulate responses. GE blocks FC binding. So what the virus does is when a, an antibody binds to GD or any other HSV protein, GE combined with GI binds the FC receptors and it stops FC recognizing cells like NK cells and macrophages that recognize an, an antibody bound to an infected cell and kills the cell. So GE blocks the ability of FC receptor recognizing cells from seeing the, the infected cell and killing it. By including the GC and GE immunogens, we block the ability of HSV2 to avoid those immune responses. So when we put those into a vaccine, and we're now comparing them to a trivalent protein that had the same GC, GD, and GEs, the proteins were given three times the mRNAs were given twice, but the neutralizing titers from the mRNAs were much higher for GC, GD, and GE. So the mRNA gave a superior, a much better antibody response against all three proteins. When we measured neutralization, we saw the same thing. mRNA had much higher levels of neutralization compared to the protein. So we picked the protein to go forward with. This is an overview of the challenge studies. So the controls were poly-C RNA. All 25 animals got sick and had to be euthanized. All 25 animals had viral replication 
in the general track two days and four days later. They all had viral DNA in the dorsal root ganglia. That's how you get latency with HSV2 infection. When we looked at the trivalent mRNA, none of the animals had viral replication in the general tract. One of them had virus in a dorsal root ganglia. We think that was probably a laboratory error because there wasn't virus anywhere else. We don't know how it got into the dorsal root ganglia. With protein, it wasn't bad, but four out of the animals had replication in the general tract. Five of the animals had virus in the dorsal root ganglia. So we had close to 97 plus percent, percent sterilizing immunity with the mRNA vaccine that hadn't been seen in any of the previous three that went into human clinical trials. So this is now going into humans, hoping to see can we get sterilizing immunity with mRNA vaccines for HSV2 uh, infection. The mechanisms I discussed previously, we also looked, and what we found is that for HSV2, we also had responses against subdominant proteins, proteins that uh, you, know, you didn't see responses against with DNA or protein subunit vaccines. wanted to tell you about one more vaccine, uh, and this is a vaccine that we're working with uh, Kiat and the Chula vac uh, uh, VRC to make a pan-coronavirus vaccine. So there have been three coronavirus epidemics in the past 20 years, uh, SARS, MERS, and COVID-19. You have to think that if there have been three, there's going to be more in the future. So we can wait for the next coronavirus epidemic or pandemic. We can go like crazy to make new vaccines. Maybe we'll do it in less than 10 months. But that still shuts the, shuts the world down for a year and a half. Or we can make a vaccine now that will protect against all bat coronaviruses and have a vaccine that's either ready the next time we have a crossover or we can immunize people with now to prevent any future beta coronavirus vaccine. So I'm going to tell you about one which uses a receptor binding domain piece. So the spike has a receptor binding domain. The receptor binding domain is what binds ACE2 and infects rep respiratory epithelial cells. What our collaborators in Duke did is they linked the receptor binding domain to a ferritin molecule. And when that's produced, the ferritin produces a nanoparticle. And the nanoparticle has 16 RBD proteins on its surface. By EM, you get very nice nanoparticles produced. We immunized animals with the RBD ferritin molecule, and we analyzed neutralizing antibodies. This is SARS. We got great responses against SARS, COVID-19. Um, these are two bat coronaviruses. So these are coronaviruses that have the potential to infect humans someday. And here, the, these coronaviruses use ACE2 to infect. Um, and the immunogen made very good levels of neutralizing antibodies, both in mice and, more importantly, in macaques. Now, we only had, or, or Ralph Barrick only had two uh, bat coronaviruses that he had, he could measure neutralization against. These are a few more coronaviruses 
uh, from the beta coronavirus family that bind ACE2 that had very high levels of binding. These are pangolin coronaviruses that also have the ability to use ACE2. This is the MERS coronavirus. So MERS is a, uh, our coronaviruses that can vac uh, in induce uh, uh, camels and induce MERS. And uh, the SARS went away quickly. The MERS is still around. We wanted to understand why we were getting such broad immunity uh, get with this immunogen. So this is the SARS uh, spike protein. And for coronaviruses, for SARS-CoV-2, most vaccines and infections produce responses with a 1041-like uh, antibody. And that binds to the peak, the, the top of the receptor binding domain. The ferritin RBD molecule made responses against the side, which is unexpected and was seen very poorly. When you look at the, bind, at the binding domain of the ferritin molecule, the antibodies, the 1047 antibody, makes a response that mainly recognizes conserved epitopes. So these are amino acids that are conserved across all beta uh, the beta coronavirus. And they're highly conserved. There's a little bit of variation, but compared across most bat coronaviruses, there's very little variability. And that's why you're getting such a broad protective immune response. So this is one, and we've now made over six different immunogens that induce responses against highly conserved regions that are broadly reactive against all bat coronaviruses that have a potential to infect humans at some point in the future. And uh, we've actually got one of these immunogens that are, uh, has been funded and is being studied in uh, the Chula VRC to make broadly reactive immunogens. So I'm going to stop there and answer questions and grab a little something to eat while you think of your questions. Okay. Yeah, thanks a lot, uh, Drew. So you're going to have another part, right? The uh, yeah. uh, therapeutic part, yeah. Uh, so for the first part of the uh, uh, talk uh, by Drew, uh, now uh, he has uh, focused on the uh, vaccine development. So any question? Yeah. Uh, Dr. Tanjubi, please. Thank you very much for your talk. Um, I'm Dr. Tan Yui, I'm pediatric infectious disease. I have two questions. The first one, when you describe about how mRNA work, you mentioned that it's um, have a system that stimulate the T follicular helper cell. My question is that because the immune system in infant or young children may be different from adult. So what do you think about the response of mRNA in young children. Young means like infant or less than two years old. And the second question is that um, as a ped pediatric infectious disease, I think virus that is very um, like um, impact infant mortality rate is RSV virus, which we don't have any vaccine. So do you think that messenger RNA, if we can prove that it can cause like stimulate immunity in, in, in COVID, can it be translate to to have a clinical impact on RSV, which is the most uh, important virus for infant. Thank you. So that's a great question. 
So as uh, the pediatricians here know that when you immunize a mother, you get antibodies that cross over into the infants and protect them for about six months. The problem is, is you can't immunize those infants against many of those diseases. But they're protected. The problem is, is when mom's antibodies wear away, usually around six months, then the infants have to make their own. And you've got a period of time where they don't make their own antibodies, and mom's antibodies are gone, and they're at increased risk of infections. If you try to immunize an infant when the mother has given them protective antibodies, the vaccines don't work. You don't make any antibodies. We investigated in mice uh, with influenza, and what we found is that the RNA LNP vaccine in six-day-old mice, so mice that had high levels of maternal antibodies, the RNA vaccine made very strong antibody responses. Inactivated viruses, vaccines made nothing. Live virus infection, the infants made no antibodies. So there's something about the RNA LNP vaccine that can make antibody responses in the setting of maternal antibodies. And that's critical, because if we can start immunizing our children, even though they have maternal antibodies, they'll make their own antibodies that will protect them when the maternal antibodies wear off. So that has roles in many different infections that can infect humans uh, in infants when the maternal antibodies disappear. So we think that it may be a great vaccine to use in infants. Another thing we've done is we've been able to combine 20 different mRNAs together in a single vaccine. And we get responses against all 20 of those proteins uh, encoded by the RNAs. So maybe someday, and pharmaceutical companies hate it when I say this, maybe someday, uh, and, our, and moms here that have ever had kids will love it, we'll bring our kids in um, and at a one month or two weeks of age, give them an RNA vaccine that protects them against everything that you otherwise have to bring your kids back over and over and over to get vaccines against. Uh, so the future might be three RNA vaccines and you're protected for life against the 20 most critical immunogens that kids are uh, uh, exposed to. So do you think that um, infants in development of immune system will respond to mRNA in the same way as older children and adults? especially in the first year of life or first two years of life? So we've seen that in mice. We've seen that six-day-old mice make great responses to RNA vaccines. So we think, we hope, that infants will also make great responses. So far, five years old and up, they've had great responses, better than what we see in adults. There have been trials of kids six months old and up, and there's been an issue that the dose of antigen was too low in the, in, in the youngest of kids, and the responses weren't great. So they had to go back and repeat those trials with higher doses. Uh, but I think ultimately the RNA vaccines will work very well for COVID-19 and most other viral pathogens in infants. And may I have another question is that uh, for repetitive um, booster, for example, comparing to inactivated vaccine or a viral live virus vaccine, when you repeat it again, the third time and the fourth time, the response might not be as 
um, robust as in the first primary series. So do you think that with the technology of mRNA, would it be, have any effect when you do a repetitive um, dose? Yeah, so some of us have already seen this. I, I've had three uh, boosts, and the third boost increased my antibody levels 20-fold, 30-fold. There's nothing in the RNA vaccine that is from the RNA. The only protein made is the protein you put into it, the coding sequence of interest. So unlike an adenovirus, where you have all the adenoviral proteins that make the spike protein, and the, the responses will decrease after multiple immunizations, with RNA, there's none of that. The only protein comes from the coding sequence you put into it. So there isn't any response against an other RNA-derived protein. There are none. Other questions from the floor or from the audience? Yes, please. I have two questions, actually. Um, the first question is, do you know the mechanism how the mRNA vaccine um, actuates the follicular helper T cells strongly? Um, and the second question is the cell-mediated immune response. Did you um, see superior response um, compared to other type of vaccines? Um, to, um, could, you, could you repeat? Uh, okay, the yeah, first I'm question sure is, do you know the mechanism the how yeah. the um, lipid nanoparticle and M mRNA vaccine actuate follicular helper T cells? Yeah. So what we do know is they don't make type 1 interferons. And type 1 interferons inhibit TFH yeah. responses. They also make very high levels of IL-6 that in a mouse stimulates TFHs. In humans, they're not associated. So we really, we know some of the reasons why we make TFHs, but we don't know the mechanism. We don't know what the signaling mechanism is that induces TFHs, and we're trying to figure that out. And, and related to that question, um, if you compare the cell-mediated immune responses, do you see better um, cell-mediated immune response compared to other type of vaccines? So compared to protein subunit vaccines, which make very poor T cell responses, the mRNA does much better. Adenoviruses also make good T cell responses. The problem is, is that we can't measure T cell responses in humans clinically. You can't send your patient in and say, measure T cell responses. But we know, and what we've seen in the phase one trials, is that the Pfizer BioNTech vaccine made great T cell responses and great CD8 responses. The Moderna wasn't so good, and we don't quite understand why that is. They both make very good CD4 helper T cell responses. And what Ugar Sahin and others have shown is that for cancer, it's actually the CD4 responses that are protective, not the CD8s. So for cancer vaccines going forward, RNA works very well. There's clinical trials going on right now uh, that have shown good responses to certain types of cancers, not others. There's a lot more investigation, so that's what all these young guys here need to do in the future, is to figure out how to make T cell vaccines uh, from mRNA that work well. Fair enough. Shut down. Oh, how is it down? Can you hear me? Okay, sorry. So, uh, follow up to uh, Dr. Tadapai's question. Is that adjuvant property of the RNP, is it specific to the design or is it generalized property? If it's like general property. 
property of LNG or a particular one? So it, it requires the ionizable cationic lipid. If you take that out, you don't get the TFH adjuvant. Uh, Katie talked about an alternative lipid nanoparticle that doesn't have an ionizable cationic lipid that has no adjuvant activity. So there's something about the ionizable cationic lipid that gives the adjuvant activity. We don't know what the signaling of that is yet. Peter can help us figure that out. So uh, one more question for me about the pan coronavirus. So when you put that uh, the spike on the ferritin molecule, how can you explain that? How, how does it help to target to that epitope? Or it's just, uh, um, you, you know what I mean? So I'm not sure I understand the question. So you show that the, the antibody that generated that right, target the conserved epitope of that uh, spike, RBD, but uh, what is the mechanism of, you know, putting that subunit on the ferritin, make it tap in like that? Yeah, that, that's for you guys to figure out. <laughs> we found that it's I there. See. I see. Why it's made. I, I mean, my guess, and it's purely a guess right now, uh -huh. you get enormous germinal center responses mm -hmm. with RNA LNPs. Mm -hmm. If you look at a lymph node and stain for germinal centers, they're everywhere and they're enormous. What I think probably happens is those big germinal centers allow lots of different antibody responses, epitope responses to develop. When you've got a very small, there's competition. So only the strongest binding antibodies survive. That's my guess. Thank you. Yeah. Dr. Warfel. Hello, Cap. Hello, Cap. Uh, Professor Weisman, thank you so much for your very impressive uh, presentation. Uh, I have a question that I believe you have got this uh, many times from lay community who are hesitant or uncertain or afraid of side effect of mRNA vaccine. Uh, well, there have been observations that foreign RNA can get into nucleus and incorporate it into host genome. So is it possible that, um, well, this RNA molecule get into just one of my cells and then induce a carcinogenic process and I get cancer? So uh, what, what would you, what, what is your uh, response to that? Thank you. Yeah, so it, it's just not possible. Um, the, the RNA in the vaccine is an mRNA. And if mRNAs could integrate, our DNA would be full of every mRNA in our body. Um, the, the RNA doesn't go into the nucleus. It can't integrate into the DNA. It's just impossible for an RNA to integrate uh, into DNA uh, to cause any damage. Now, you can encode Cas9 proteins, and the Cas9 proteins can break DNA, but the RNA can't. mRNAs can't uh, disrupt, break, damage uh, DNA. Okay, thank you, thank you. And it's funny, I, I, it, it took a lot of work to put chips in all of those vaccines, so that's... Uh, any other questions? Yeah, please go ahead. Identify yourself, please. Uh, so um, I'm a medical student, so this might be a silly question. But uh, I just wonder about the pan-coronavirus immunogen, um, that it acts against the conserved regions on the RBD regions of the coronavirus. So I wonder if this conserved region will still be conserved in future uh, mutated SARS-CoV-2 infection, and would this uh, pan-coronavirus immunogen work against future newly mutated variants. So 
My, I've had great teachers who told me the only silly question is one that isn't asked. So th there are no silly questions. Um, when, when we look at con conservation, we're looking across hundreds of thousands, now millions of sequences of beta coronaviruses. And what we see is that there are certain regions across all of those beta coronaviruses that aren't, there's no mutations. They probably occur in enzymes that have very specific functions. So the mutations cause a big loss of fitness and the viruses don't survive. Now, if we make a vaccine against a conserved region, is it possible you can get a mutation in that conserved region? Probably, but the virus will take a fitness hit and will the virus survive? So th that's what happens with HIV. We, we have uh, reverse transcriptase inhibitors. The, the, a mutation will appear that makes the drug not work and the virus doesn't grow as well. And it has to form other mutations to make up for that to gain its fitness back. So yes, you can probably get mutations in conserved regions, but the virus doesn't like it. There's a loss of fitness. Thank you. Any other questions? Yeah, Chris, go ahead. Hello, Dr. Weissman. I, my name is Kun Yot. I am a doctor and also a research assistant. I have some questions about the LMP technologies that, um, that some people might concern about the side effects of like a high grade of fever and myocarditis, which have a promising um, theory about the, that related to L LMP. What if we can uh, what things that we can modify the LMP to make the less side effects, this side effects? So the, the, the adverse effects that most of us have probably had after we got the vaccine, the, the sore arm, the little bit of redness, and probably around 20% of us, mostly your young guys, had feeling lousy and fever the next day. That's, I, I don't think of those as side effects. Well, what those are, th that's adjuvant activity. That's the vaccine stimulating our immune response to make a better immune response. So, the, the, you know, the, they're not side effects. They're, that, that's the vaccine, that's the LNP doing its job. Um, can we completely get rid of it? Maybe. I mean, you know, Peter will talk about increasing the potency of the LNP, which will allow us to reduce the dose that should reduce the amount of sore arms and feeling lousy. Um, but you know, the, 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 those aren't bad things. That, that means the vaccine is working, uh, that our immune response is responding. Thank you. So I should probably go and finish my talk and then we can do more questions. Uh, let, uh, let me finish yeah. my talk and then we'll do more questions. Yeah. Okay. So the yeah, last so question. Maybe, uh, maybe. We, we move on and then yeah, no, you, you keep your question for the next. Okay. Sure. Next, yeah, okay. Yeah, we move on, yeah, please. Yeah, you want to switch to another? You could keep on, yeah, all right. Yeah, yeah so uh, we, we're going to go on to, for the uh, future therapeutics approach and then uh, we, we have another session for questions. Yeah, please. So I, I put this sl slide up to, to, a, to toot Penn's horn. So but Penn clinically developed CAR T cells. Uh, there's two that are FDA approved that came out of research from Penn. There's many more that are being approved right now. Uh, Penn had the first FDA approved gene therapy for blindness, for retinal uh, 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 the, the disease. Um, so Penn has a big interest in therapeutics and gene therapy. Um, so we, we 
we've been interested in RNA forever. Um, and the vaccine was an incredible success. But we've also had an interest in RNA therapeutics and other types of therapy using mRNA beyond vaccines. And the problem always came up is how do you get it to the right place? So I showed you when you inject anything, uh, LNP's IV or IP, and even IM sometimes, they go to the liver. And Intellia, a company in Cambridge, has already used LNPs to do gene therapy on the liver. They, they cured three people in their phase one clinical trial. But what if you have to target a different cell type? What if you want to target bone marrow stem cells or, or any other cell in the body? So we, we've been working on ways of targeting LNPs to other cells. And the approach that we took is we attach a targeting ligand. It can be an antibody, it can be a piece of an antibody, it can be a receptor ligand. We, we target that to the end of the PEG molecule uh, on an LNP. So now we've got an LNP that has the RNA on the inside and it has a targeting moiety on the outside. When we examined those LNPs to make sure that we didn't kill them, um, they maintained their size, they maintained their distribution. They were a little bit bigger. That's actually the size of an antibody coating on an LNP. And most importantly is they retain function. So th these are cells that express PCAM or not. We attached a PCAM an binding antibody. PCAM is a ligand on endothelial cells. That's important for endothelial cell function. Here, these are cells that express PCAM in red, and we're measuring luciferase expression. So they're targeting the PCAM on the surface. They're going into the cells, releasing their RNA, and the RNA is being translated. These are human uh, UVEX. Um, they express PCAM. In the absence of targeting, they take up no RNA, nothing. When we put a PCAM antibody that targets the UVEX and give them GFP, just about every cell makes protein. So we can effectively target primary cells, get them to take up the LNP uh, and express the RNA. When we inject these IV into an animal and measure luciferase expression under IVIS, which is essentially a camera that measures light production, LNPs without any modifications go to the liver. Um, nothing in the heart, lungs, kidney. Uh, you can sometimes get a little in the spleen, usually not. When we put a control IgG on the LNP, we lose a lot of our liver uptake, but nothing anywhere else. When we add PCAM antibodies, we lose liver, and now we light up the lungs. So we're specifically targeting lungs with LNPs that are taking them up, expressing the mRNA, and producing the protein. We've got a couple of publications out already uh, one that targets lungs, another that targets brain, that shows we can f deliver functional activity with the mRNA. So we can target, we can deliver therapeutics, and we can mediate, we can treat diseases. My, uh, my lab has had a long interest in HIV, uh, so we wanted to see could we target CD4 positive T cells as part of a cure technology. Same thing, we put CD4 on the surface of an LNP, we added them to CD4 cells, we can measure high levels of binding uh, at very low doses. T cells were a bit trickier. So the T cells have no endocytic activity, and what that means is that they cannot take up particles. 
if you try to transfect them with mRNA or DNA, they don't do it. They don't take them up. The only way you can deliver nucleic acid to a T cell is with electroporation. But our idea was, if we add a nanoparticle, 80 nanometer nanoparticle, that has an anti-CD4 antibody, that will bind to the T cell. CD4 is endocytosed after binding. That's how HIV gets into a cell. The CD4 endocytosis will bring the LNP in. So that takes care of the endocytosis problem. And when we did that, we saw very good expression of the luciferase in primary T cells. So we could target and deliver RNA and get expression. We switched to a reporter gene mouse. So th these are they're, uh, AI6, there are LOXP mice. Uh, they have uh, LOXP sites surrounding a stop cassette in front of a fluorescent protein. And if you deliver Cree recombinase, Cree recombinase recognizes the LOXP sites and removes the stop codon and turns the fluorescent protein on. So it's a way of measuring LNP delivery of Cree recombinase to these cells. We took cells in vitro and added LNPs to them. When we added targeted LNPs, we had up to 50% of the cells were now expressing the green fluorescent, the, the fluorescent protein. When we injected them into mice, we saw lighting up of the spleen, which are where many T cells are. We purified the T cells from the spleen and showed that the activity was in T cells, not in macrophages or dendritic cells, which also had activity. But what was most interesting is we took those animals, so the animals that we took all of those organs out, we re-imaged them, and we saw luciferase activity in lymph nodes. These are paraortic and inguinal lymph nodes. So that means that the IV-injected lipid nanoparticles escaped from the circulation, went into the tissues, went into the draining lymphatics to the lymph nodes, bound to T cells in the lymph nodes, the luciferase was taken up, expressed, and made protein. So we're able to target LNPs to tissues and lymphatics throughout the mouse. The other interesting thing, and it, maybe it's just interesting to me because I'm interested in HIV, this is an activation marker here. Um, in HIV, the latently infected cells, so these are cells that have an HIV provirus in them, are late, they're latently unactivated resting T cells. And that's why the virus isn't expressed. Here we're measuring activation, um, and we've used all the different markers. We see equal amounts of activity in resting cells than in activated cells. So we can target resting cells in vivo that can take up the LNPs, make the protein, and mediate a gene recombination. So we're moving forward with these trials for HIV cure studies. We're delivering a, a few different approaches. One in particular, we're delivering enzymes, uh, Cas9 and other variants that can cut proviruses out of chromosomal DNA with the idea of using this to treat latency by depleting latently infected T cells. We also, being the place where CARS started, we were interested in targeting all CAR T cells. And to do this, we changed our targeting molecule. And we, we looked at a whole bunch of them, but we ended up with a CD5 molecule. CD5 is a scavenger receptor that's expressed by all T cells and a subset of B cells. 
We chose it because as a scavenger receptor, it's endocytosis after binding a ligand, and it doesn't have signaling properties in a T cell. And our idea was, so um, it, it, if you've ever done CAR therapy, what CAR therapy involves is you take a patient with ALL or, or uh, whatever disease you're treating, you leukophoresis them. So th that's a machine where you take blood out of a patient, it spins the blood, removes white blood cells, and gives it back. And it keeps doing that over two hours, and it takes out about two billion white blood cells from a patient. You take those white blood cells and you go to a GMP cell culture facility, you activate them for usually about 10 days. When they're expanded and activated, you infect them with a lentivirus that puts a gene for a CAR molecule into the T cells. You then take those T cells and you give them back to the patient. That's the CAR therapy. The, the cost of that in the U.S. is about a half a million dollars per dose. And you can see why. It's 10 days in a cell culture facility. Our idea was, can we take an LNP that has a car expressing mRNA on it and put it into an LNP that we target to T cells? So the LNP will bind to T cells. It'll get taken up. The RNA escapes. The RNA is translated, and we put CAR molecules on the surface of the T cell. So we chose a CAR that recognizes fibrotic cells. And um, we made these, and we put them in vitro. We had 80% of the T cells have the CAR on the surface. We injected them in vivo, 20% of the T cells express CAR on their surface. Typically in a CAR T cell therapy, 0.1% of the T cells have CAR. So we were nervous about this. Um, we, we used a model of hypertension in a mouse. And when you make a mouse hypertensive, they develop cardiac fibrosis. Uh, and they develop very quickly. So we can see here in blue, these are normal mice. In yellow, these are hypertensive mice. And in red, these are treated with a CD5-targeted CAR-T. And th these are echocardiograms. Um, th this is probably the most important. This is the ejection fraction. So we can see a, a really big drop in ejection fraction with cardiac fibrosis. So you, you put fibrosis in a heart, it can't pump anymore. Um, one treatment of CAR-Ts, FAP CAR-Ts, put ejection fraction back to normal. Uh, these are end diastolic volumes, a variety of other measurements, but you know, the, the, the ultimate is a single treatment of FAP CAR-Ts cured the fibrosis in this animal model. We also have a big interest in bone marrow stem cells. There are hundreds of genetic diseases. Um, the, the ones that we're principally interested in are sickle cell anemia. And the, the problem with sickle cell is there is an FDA-approved gene therapy for sickle cell in the US. What it involves is you take bone marrow out of a patient, a lot of bone marrow you infect it with a lentivirus, and then you give it back. And usually that cures the patient. 200,000 people a year are born with sickle cell in Africa and India. You can't do 200,000 bone marrow biopsies and viral infections. It's impossible. With this therapy, we can target bone marrow stem cells and deliver an enzyme that corrects the genetic defect in beta hemoglobin, a single IV injection could cure sickle cell anemia. So here, we're using CD117 to target. Uh, the importance here, this is simply showing binding to bone marrow stem cells. 
we see very high levels of binding and gene expression. These animals, uh, th th these are the lox pea mice. They were treated with a single injection of bone marrow targeted Cree recombinase containing mRNA. We see that here it was 80% of the bone marrow stem cells underwent genetic recombination. That's an enormous level of targeting. We followed the animals for six months. They remained above 80%. We've done secondary transplant. So what that means is you take the bone marrow from these mice and you transplant them into another mice, mouse. 100% of those mice had green uh, blood cells. So we, that, what that tells you is that you've permanently recombined the repopulating bone marrow stem cells in these animals. To cure sickle cell anemia, you have to edit about 20 to 25% of the stem cells. To cure most immune deficiency skid, you have to edit about 1% of the cells. So we're at 80% right now. We've got plenty of room to move. So th this, to me, is, is the future, or one of the futures of mRNA, where we can target and deliver things in vivo, and we can do gene therapy, we can do car therapy, we, and, and most importantly, we can make them available to the entire world. Uh, whereas now, if you want a CAR T therapy, you have to come to the United States. So I need to thank all of the people who were involved in these studies, and there, there's too many to mention, but um, you know, in, in particular, Norbert Pardee, who did much of the vaccine studies, um, Acuitas Therapeutics for the LNPs, Scott for the influenza, uh, Bart's lab for HIV, um, Barrick lab for the, uh, the uh, pan-coronavirus, and the Epstein lab for the cardiac fibrosis model. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Drew. It's always, anytime when we listen to your talk, a lot of new things coming in, <laughs> and uh, really amazing work in, uh, from your group. Um, any questions from your folk? Yeah, please. Uh, thank you very much for a very interesting talk. So I just have a question on the duration of protein expression. So do you see the difference in the uh, protein expression between different uh, types of proteins? For example, when you try to express the viral antigen versus tumor antigen, or even like to express CAR? So every coding sequence, every protein is expressed differently. And there, there's a lot of different things that modulate how much protein a coding sequence will make. Um, viruses often have, so viruses typically will put lousy signal peptides to reduce the amount of protein made. Um, they'll have microRNA sequences. There's, there's a lot of different ways. Um, you know, I, when somebody asks me how much protein is made from an RNA, it depends on the RNA. Uh, everyone is different. Like, so the duration of expression will be different. It depends on the type of protein more than the characteristic of the RNA that we produce, right? Like. Yeah, so it, it, it depends. Now, we, we do a lot of things to increase that. So we optimize the coding sequence that Katie described. We optimize the UTRs. We optimize the signal peptide to try and get more protein per RNA molecule. Uh, and another question is um, about the mRNA-based CAR T cells. Can you comment on the anti-tumor activity of the mRNA-based CAR T comparing to the like typical viral-based CAR T? So P Penn has done clinical trials where they, that they used RNA um, 
so th 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 they did the same thing. They expanded T cells from a patient, but instead of infecting them with a lentivirus, they transfected them with CAR T mRNA. Um, and, and they found similar efficacy for treatment of, of, of a few different leukemias. I have a question about related to the side effects of the mRNA. So as mRNA, most of the patients has some of the, pro pro like a very tiny portion of the have a inflammation in myocardium. And I took two doses of Pfizer and the third dose of the Pfizer triggered me my symptom myocardium inflammation. So the question I ask about that, when we moving towards the mRNA based vaccines, as you explained also the therapeutics, and also the audience asked previously about giving into the infants, that we are increasing the risk window for having this particular kind of side effects. So what's your thoughts about that and how we can overcome such a clinical scenario? Because mouse and human are quite different when it comes to therapeutic level. So that's the question is about, thank you. So you know, as I mentioned before, I, I don't consider them side effects. That they're, adver that they're, they're, they're supposed to be there. The, the vaccine is supposed to do that. So you would expect that after the third and after the fourth, you're going to have more adverse events because you're, you've already got a potent immune response and now you're stimulating it more. Um, you know, how to get around that, I'm not sure you completely want to get around that. I mean, we, you want the adjuvant effect. So if we made an LNP that had no adjuvant effect, it would tolerize you. You wouldn't get an immune response. We are looking at ways of making them more potent so we can give a lower dose and they'll have fewer adverse events. But there, you know, it, 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 it's kind of like you, you're, you're painting your house and you keep diluting the paint with water. You're just going to lose the, you know, lose the color on your house. Um, and, and you don't want to do that with the vaccine. You want to maintain the potency of the vaccine. I think the, yeah, I think, I think the point is that the concerning in the uh, community is the, not the reactogenic city, but the myocarditis, which is very rare. It's like a, 40 of the millions uh, uh, vaccination. So the question is, do we really know the mechanism and how we can prevent it? Uh, not the reactogenicity, but the specific myocarditis uh, related you know, issue. Yeah. Yes, so I, I, I hate to say this. I, I know the mechanism of myocarditis, but I can't say it because my, my collaborator would kill me. We haven't published it yet. Um, so the, the, there is a mechanism for it, and we, and we and others are working on getting rid of it. What, what's important to note is, you know, it, it, it's a couple per 100,000. It responds very quickly. It clears up very quickly. If you look at COVID-19 infection, the risk of myocarditis is about 30 times higher from infection than it is from the vaccine. So, you know, with my kids, it wouldn't be a question. The, the vaccine is much safer than the infection. Yeah, see what point? Yeah, please. Right. Regarding to your uh, presentation on the CD4 T cells, uh, packet on the CD4 T cell for HIV cure, my question is can, can be the LNP is a penetrant to the. Uh -huh. You're, you're coming in and out. The microphone is not working. Maybe you come over. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Regarding to your uh, presentation on the target CD4 T cell for HIV kill, can this LMP uh, penetrate to the silent compartment that have a uh, HIV reservoir, such as uh, ZNS compartment, uh, lymphoid, or any uh, other compartment? So it means uh, when you do the uh, HIV uh, cure uh, approach using the CD4 targeting mRNA, 
Uh, her question is that the, the, the sanctuary site of the reservoir, a latent infection, can you really reach out that area? Like the lymphoid, most of the lymphoid tissue in the gut and many other places, and the brain. Yeah. Yeah. So what we don't know yet. What we're testing this in macaques. I mean, we, we, we find the, 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 we find label tissues in the GI tract. Uh, we find them in lymph nodes. We find them in every organ and every tissue. Um, you know, the, the, the problem with HIV latency, it's one out of a million has a virus in it, mm -hmm. and one out of a hundred of those has a, has a live virus in it. And you're trying to hit one out of a hundred million cells means you have to have incredible efficiency. And you know, we're at 80% with a single dose. So we've got a long ways to go. So my, my, question, my second question is about the core infection in HIV, which is just the tuberculosis. Any, uh, there are any so development on mRNA vaccine for TB? Um, so the, 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 the pr what we are looking at therapies in TB. One of them, and I'm not sure it's good or not, is our fibrosis treatment. Because you know, the, the issue with TB is if you've been infected in your prior life uh, without disease, you have a granuloma in your lung. And that granuloma is a, is a fibrotic ball. And in the middle of it is a bacterium or a couple bacterium uh, in a macrophage that's controlled by the immune response. Uh, when you get HIV, you lose the immune response and it escapes. But the question is, if we've now, you know, if we've got HIV infected people or even uninfected people, can we give them uh, antifibrotic CAR T's to break the granulomas down uh, so that drugs can get at the bacteria? It, it's a crazy idea. I'm not sure we're going to try it or not. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? So, uh, Drew, you mentioned about the flu vaccine. So, so my question is that uh, based on your very beautiful data on the anti uh, the stock, uh, you know, uh, approach, is there any clinical trial on that uh, uh, stock-based uh, influenza vaccine trial? And what the is there any promising data that we're going to get uh, uh, to that clinical use very soon? So we we started a clinical trial for on on the stock immunogen before COVID-19 hit. Uh, it, it's been delayed because of the pandemic. Uh, it is going forward. We've we've made a lot of other immunogens. Uh, the, the, some are stock based. Some are M2E based, some are NA based, some are combinations of all of those. So we, we've got a lot of different immunogens that we're currently trying in ferrets and we're moving to clinical trials if they look good. So in your view, so what will be the next uh, mRNA vaccine beyond COVID-19 vaccine to get approved for the clinical use? Yeah, it, it's a great question. I mean, um, Moderna has a CMV vaccine that's fairly far along. I don't know. I haven't seen any results from it yet. Um, th there's, th there's a few influenza vaccines in clinical trials. Um, and I'm sure there's a lot more we don't know about. So mm -hmm. I, I'm not sure. Okay. I'm, I'm, I'm hoping it's a pan coronavirus. Yeah, pan corona. I, I think that's needed. Okay. Yep. All right. So we done. We done. Okay. All right. Uh, I think we uh, finished the uh, second uh, talk, and then uh, we're going to. Lunch break later, on. and then we will come back about uh, one fifteen uh, for the last talk. Thank you very much. Let me uh, uh, thank uh, Drew by giving this. <laughs>
Oh, okay. Someone else? Uh, so the speaker and all you invited guests, uh, please join our lunch, and then the rest, please, uh, you know, come back, uh, take care of yourself for lunch, and then come back at uh, 1.15, please. <laughs>